There's plenty of crazy people ranting around on the internet, as we all know, and I certainly don't have time to address all of them. And normally, I don't. I kind of just, okay, well, they believe something I completely don't believe, or they're just kind of nutty. But Brian Lunduk, he's been around for a little while, and I, as a longtime Linux person, you will run into Brian and some of his fun rants on, you know, different things he's done. And because he actually has some credibility in the market, I guess, so we will discuss his uh, crazy 23-minute and 39-second rant on HTTPS is dangerous. Uh, so, by the way, and maybe he'll update this, but as of right now, he doesn't really have anything to tell us more about why he thinks it's dangerous other than his words with no backing. So we're going to run through a couple of the things he talks about real quick here. HTTP encrypts the connection, verifies on the test of the site. <clears throat> that is my first problem. Now, does it encrypt? Yes. Does it verify the authenticity of the site? He doesn't take the time to discuss the type of certification it is. For example, if you use Let's Encrypt, there is no verification of the site. Let's Encrypt's an automated encryption system, and it will not do any validation. If you are selling online, you need things like an EV certification, extended validation. And for, as someone who has a web development company and who is and set these up and set up e-stores and all kinds of fun stuff, yes, you need to have extended validation certificates and they actually verify who you are. Matter of fact, years ago when it started, they used to have to mail you things and uh, verify your address. They, they go through a little bit less, but you do have to pay for it and they do some level of verification that you're a real company depending on the type of certificates you get for extended versus the real basic certifications. And Google is now favoring some of the HTTPS because we want to see levels of encryption and the encryption is fine, which we're going to get to in a second, but there are different types of security. I use on some of my websites just the basic because we're not when we're not selling anything on there or we don't have any links to where payment or private data, we just want encryption, we'll use a Let's Encrypt certificate. So I verify his authentic site only in certain, uh, and he claimed that's a myth that it doesn't do anything to verify it. There actually is some verification there. I don't know why he has a problem with certificates expiring. Now, the reason they expire is because what if I uh, you know, shut down a website or at least no longer maintain it, the verification needs to go through. Now, if, if it's an automated system on Let's Encrypt, it will automatically never expire. And it's funny because I think in there he actually says, well, Apple's getting sued for this forced obsolescence. I'm like, no, if you're using an EV cert, they want to keep verifying the companies in business. That way there's some type of mechanism by which to expire them. And that's actually the nice thing about when you're using non-verified things like Let's Encrypt. It's automated. I don't have to think about my Let's Encrypt certificate expiring. It automatically keeps renewing on all the websites you have it on. So forced obsolescence, eh, okay, weird. But let's jump to the other things he has to say here. This is where he grabs his tinfoil hat and firmly places it on his head. So, SHA-1 secure hash algorithm developed by the NSA. Sorry, Mr. Lunduk. Not everything by the NSA is awful bad and is out to destroy things. He also makes the viewers think, if you don't know what SHA-1 is, it's a not a magic black box that you put data in and encrypted data comes out. That's not how this works. These are published math algorithms. So they're essentially open source and open standard so we can understand them. And very smart people who are better at math than me have gone through these algorithms and we've seen you know, verification. It's not some mystical, we don't know, we just plug these magic formulas in developed by the NSA and blindly trust them. No. People like Bruce Schneier, P people who, Matthew Green, people who are really good at math and engineering people have gone through this and go, all right, this is good. Now, what we do know is the uh, key size used for SHA-1, they have been able to because as computing gets faster, and you got to remember how this works, they create uh, a security algorithm that you have to guess the password. The idea is it's hard to guess. Well, hard to guess as in based on the speed of the computer. As computers become faster, we have seen and we're now retiring SHA-1, which has been around for a very long time, and because you can now crack it within reasonable time, because we have massive uh, data centers, you could use the power of these data centers to basically brute force your way through it. And there's been people who have been able to create some of these, what they refer to as a name collision, uh, and be able to uh, crack SHA-1. It's not arbitrary, it's not easy, but if you got money to throw at compute time at a data center, you can do it. But that's also why we've deprecated this. This is where he moves into the next part. 
uh, it was a SHA-2 developed by the NSA. So SHA-2 is the replacement because it uses a much larger key and therefore we've now kicked it down the road till we have super, super fast computers, maybe thousands of years from now that are able to crack this. So SHA-2, no, there's not any easy way to crack this. But once again, he says developed by the NSA. Well, the NSA does, as much as I will agree with you that they're not the greatest people, uh, they are an agency of spying and we should fight against that and I hate all the privacy concerns with them. Uh, but they also do have to protect their stuff. And so if they contribute to the mathematics community and it gets vetted, it's not like they're, once again, they're not submitting a black box going, use our magical encryption box. No, they are submitting an algorithm, an algorithm that is able to be researched and read. So. Yeah, I, I don't really understand this, but we're going to get to a couple other things because I will, of course, leave links to all my sources for this information. I'm uh, He has a lack of sources other than his voice and random. He's been around a lot of this community, so I'm not saying you have to verify everything. You get some clout for being around for a little while, but yeah, he's really going off there. Now, this is where he jumps in, recommended random number, blah, 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 and talks about the NIST adopting NSA standards and rants about that. And before we jump into the more complexity, more vulnerabilities, that's the part I really want to address. So first, let's go through and cite sources for this. If you're not familiar with this, and we're going to actually start right here, intent to deprecate or remove trust in existing semantic issued certificates. He says you can just hack a CA. You, no, it's arbitrary. Any real hacker worth his salt. No. When problems are found in CAs, and Symantec did a horrible job with their CA system, no one knows anything that was compromised in their CA system, but... That being said, Google took hard steps against them, said, look, you guys have some flaws we found in your process we don't like uh, through our security research team. So we are now removing and deprecating trust in these and actually shorten the validation of their certificates uh, to make sure Symantec was following process. Symantec's answer, which was good, DigiCert has a great reputation for as a CA. So DigiCert uh, acquired Symantec. I think that's kind of the solution. Like, we're bad at it. We're going to sell it to you guys, and you can follow all the details. I'm not going to read it to you, but you get the idea. And I'll, once again, I'll leave both these in here. So that was the how that happened. Now let's address the... The Strange Story of Extended Random. And I'm going to leave this. I'm not going to read the entire article to you, but I want you to read through it if you want. But I'll give you the short of it here. We do realize that the NSA made some attempts. Now, for security to work, you need entropy, as in random numbers. That's a very important thing. So there was some influence that the NSA attempted to create random number generators that were not so random in a way that works. Let's say the random number generator, you know, produces numbers between one and a billion, but it turns out they're not quite so random. It actually, let's just say, produces more like a thousand different numbers. So to the naked eye, you'd say, wow, it just keeps producing the same thousand numbers out of a potential billion. Therefore, it becomes increasing level to hack. This is just a concept. I'm overviewing it real lightly here, but if you want to read the details, the numbers are much bigger than what I'm talking about, and we're going to talk about the actual thing that happened. So we're going to jump down here, and it's called Extended Random. In the course of reverse engineering the Java version of BSafe, we discovered a funny inclusion. Specifically, we found that BSafe supports a non-standard extension of the TLS protocol called Extended Random. The Extended Random extension is an IETF draft proposed by the NSA employee named Margaret Salter, at some point head of the NSA's Information Assurance Director, which worked on defensive crypto for the DoD, along with Eric uh, Riscola as a contractor, Eric was very clear, hired to develop a decent proposal that wouldn't hurt TLS and would primarily be used in government machines. The NSA did not share their motivations with him. So in short, what they did and what be safe is, this is a specific protocol part of the overall RSA and the, all the details are in here, but it added a certain kind of uh, nonce to it to make a more predictive TLS handshake. And this is the handshake protocol that is underlying for SSL. Uh, and it would try to produce under these circumstances. Now, these were only, oddly enough, uh, targeted at uh, standards for government machines to use. And they comment in here, and like I said, I'm going to leave you a link to this. The systems were never put in place. They can find no active uh, usage of any of this. So this is all, it, it's a very extensive and we don't worry we know the nsa is trying and going real hard against this and they are trying to add this and what this actually did and i like it actually see the data access rocket fuel significantly increasing the efficiency of exploiting dual ec backdoor to decrypt tls 
basically, like I said, you're you're adding, instead of having a high entropy, it's a lower entropy, so we have less keys to search. Still not arbitrary to crack, still difficult, but if you know the predictive keys that this is likely to do, you then can say, okay, out of the billion, it only grabs these thousands, so I only have to try these thousand or whatever the number is, but it's obviously bigger than that. I have to try these fewer, smaller key sets to try to decrypt the data that was encrypted on there. Now, this is also long since broken uh, with some of the other newer things that are on there. And of course, this never really got in use and wasn't in use because security researchers, once again, this is all highly open. And these math algorithms, if you're good at math, you can read them and learn for yourself. So you can understand that these were not put in place they were audited, they were vetted, and they go, this is stupid, and they didn't use it. So this is also why things happen like this. And we're going to go to Bruce Schneier. This guy's wicked smart. Uh, if you haven't read his books, go read his books if you got some time. Or just read his blog and can get an idea what he's in there. Also, Matthew Green, really smart uh, guy. If you didn't know who Matthew Green is, by the way, uh, Matthew Green, I'm a crypto uh, I'm sorry, cryptographer and professor at John Hopkins University. I've designed and analyzed crypto vacuum systems used in wireless networks, payment systems, and digital content protection platforms. His research is extensive. Uh, he's very well respected in the community. Not tinfoil hat, documents the math. And like I said, that's why his posts are so long. So is Bruce Shire. He's been writing about security issues, has some really interesting topics. I've actually had the pleasure of meeting Bruce Schneier. Um, he's a great guy, uh, did a keynote at an event I was at. Really smart on these same things, very tight on security, and cares deeply about privacy. So these are two people who are well respected in the community and definitely. Great. So this is also an uh, uh, article linked about the the ISO standard rejection of certain NSA encryption algorithms. Yes, a lot of these got rejected. So while he's ranting over here, I, I don't get some of his stuff because he's not verifying it. He's just saying he thinks it's arbitrary to do this or you can arbitrarily man, man in the middle. Now, he is correct that more complexity can equate to, well, statistically is going to be there. So if I have a more complicated machine, there's more potential ways for you to find holes in it. That's fact, but that doesn't mean we don't secure things. Uh, yeah, it's harder to break into my building with a lock and key, but, and it is more complicated because a lock and key could fail, uh, but it's a lot better than not having any lock and key. So if it fails 1% of the time, the reality is it, we do not see people doing this. Matter of fact, what he says is kind of wrong. He says, we learned through Snowden and all these, you know, uh, vault dumps of different three-letter agencies that they're cracking our encryption. No, we actually see the opposite. We see that all these hacking tools and, and ways they want to get on the phone directly is to bypass because they can't just see the traffic. Because they can't see the traffic, they've had to adopt other methods to get ahead of the traffic, to get ahead of the systems because of the encryption that they can't crack. And they realize that they failed at cracking encryption, so now they do more targeted attacks. And we've seen this with the Vault 7 dumps. We've seen this through what Snowden talks about. This is why they do different types because they can't just watch, sit back and watch the traffic like he claims here. So exactly um, it, downright dangerous. I completely disagree with him on that. So is it useful? Yeah. Uh, I agree. So I agree with him in saying H2 is useful, uh, not the Holy Grail. Sure. I, I, we always are at a constant effort to improve our systems that these things are built on. But downright dangerous. Uh, I'm still using HTTPS and you should be too. I, I uh, Like I said, I normally won't address some of the crazy people out there. Uh, and I don't, I'm not calling him a crazy person. I'm calling this particular video crazy, uh, which you can see the downvotes on it. And um yeah, I don't really understand what he's going at here. I understand having some extreme views. You meet a lot of people like that. And uh, you know, funny thing, I see Richard Stallman down there. I've met him talk about extreme views. Hey, I can respect that. But uh, crazy ranting of they can just hack a CA arbitrarily. No, sorry, doesn't work that way. Or crazy ranting and saying that they can just watch all your traffic with man in the middle. It's like it's not like HTTPS or TLS. I mean, come on, the NSA developed it, so it's all backdoored. No. These security researchers, and I'll leave you links in the uh, comments uh, in the description below, they have vetted it. It's uh, unless he knows these people that can allegedly do this, as he calls, I think he said the words, any hacker worth his salt. Um, please let me know. That would be interesting uh, that if the NSA has now employed people that are so brilliantly beyond the scope of what uh, major security researchers, not just one, multiple ones, and there's plenty more that have vetted this. Um, if he knows them, I, I'm fascinated by that. Maybe Brian knows something I completely don't know, uh, but I'm going to call him out on this. Uh, I'd be willing to talk with him on his show, too, if he wants to. I don't know if he has an interest. And talk with me or not, but um, 
Yeah, I, I think he's went off the deep end on this. Uh, feel free to share your comments, though, on HTTPS is dangerous. Uh, I'm curious, and if I'm completely wrong, please let me know, because uh, I, I uh, yeah, I'm kind of lost on this. And like I said, normally you don't address craziness, but Brian Luke has been around a little while, and with 5.2 million views on his channel overall, um, there's people watching them, so I figured, hey, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit. All right, thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful or explanatory, or maybe you just think I'm really wrong. Let me know what you think uh, in the comments below, and as always, like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff. Thanks.